Well, we're going to seek to wrap up Romans chapter 3 this morning, kind of flying through these first few chapters, taking big sections at a time, um, partly because the context really was written for Jews and Gentiles of that day, and so a lot of the context fits them more so than it does us, um, but also because really what we're doing right now is establishing the need for a soteriology. Soteriology is the study, the doctrine of our salvation. And so in the first three chapters, Paul has really kind of been telling us what we already know. We're sinners. We can't fix our lives. Our best attempts at righteousness are like filthy rags. Uh, and so it can almost seem a bit redundant. And yet it's really important that we establish the theological truth, the theological underpinnings that we need salvation. Because someone's not going to be saved until they're lost. We have to be lost first before we recognize the need to be saved and so even as believers, we have to remind ourselves of what we've come from, where our roots are. Uh, so we're going to wrap up this chapter this morning. We're going to do a, a ton of verses this morning. Um, and I'm going to try to give you as much as I can uh, as, as far as simplicity. I may not accomplish that, but hold on with me. We're going to teach you some big words this morning, some big theological words that I think you need to know and understand. Uh, listen, one of the problems with church today, one of the things that pastors have done that's a disservice, is we've tried to dumb down and water down Scripture too much. And there's a, there's a reason why we do that. We want to bring things to the lower shelf so people can walk away with truth applied. But at the end of the day, the, the Bible is a deep book. It's a theological book. And I don't know that we do a favor for you guys not teaching you the deeper things of Scripture. We th I think you're capable of it, and I think you need it. And so I may sometimes feel like more of a classroom setting, a college theology course. I hope you'll reach for it. I hope you'll appreciate it because when you understand these deeper theological truths, the shallow things are much more, and we say shallow, I don't think anything's shallow, but the, the things that we, we, we practice day to day become much more understandable uh, in our context, all right? So that's where we're going to go this morning. Uh, here's the ending of Romans 3. The context is this. Paul has been speaking very bluntly to the Jews that they cannot fall back on their own moral pride for security in their judgment of the Gentiles. He talked to the Gentiles in Romans 1. He said, you guys are doing all kinds of things. And if you remember, and if you haven't gone back to listen, if you missed, make sure you go back and listen or, or watch on the app. Romans 1 is our culture today. I mean, it is just part and parcel exactly what we're seeing today. They were doing the same things. And a lot of the things we do today in our culture that seem so evil and so far away from Scripture started in the Roman culture, and, and they've never stopped. And so it's very apropos. And then in, 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 Gen, in Romans 2, Paul says, hey, Jews, you guys sitting in the corner kind of judging all the Gentiles, you need to remember that, that they need Jesus to save them from their sins, but you need Jesus to save you from the law, which is also your sin. Because you think you're righteous and you're really not. And so now we're kind of wrapping up that part of this discussion. I remember two weeks ago we talked about Romans 3. We keyed in on the word circumcision. And he talks about it over and over and over again. And the reason he talks about that is because it was the symbol, the marking of the law on the Jews. And so for us today, circumcision can represent a lot of things. What we think we wear that everybody else assumes makes us a good Christian. Reality is just skin deep. We need to get to the heart of the matter. All right, so let's pick up here where he wraps up these thoughts. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Thankful for our screen back here this morning. I still like when I hear Bibles opening, even if it's on your phones and tablets. Here's what it says. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. We've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Okay, everybody's under sin. Whether you were born without any understanding of what morality is or you were born in steeped morality, the regardless, you were born into sin. Verse 10, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He's quoting there the book of Psalms. And then he quotes some more scripture. Here's what he says next. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Asps are poisonous snakes. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. All right, so he quotes their Psalm 5, Jeremiah 5, Psalm 140, and Psalm 10. And then he quotes a whole bunch of more Psalms. And a bunch more prophets here. He says this next in verse 15. 
Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I want you to notice something. When Paul wants people to understand sin, you know where he doesn't start? He doesn't start with Jesus. When you're talking to people about their sin, you don't start with Jesus. You start with creation. You start with the Old Testament. You start with Genesis. And you move forward through the law and you move forward through the prophets because original sin is what we're going to talk about this morning. Our sin is rooted originally in the DNA that we have inherited from Adam and Eve. And the whole Old Testament is about pointing forward to the second Adam, Jesus, who's going to fix all of that nonsense, all of what's broken. So hear me clearly, we need the Old Testament. There's this movement today to leave the Old Testament and not teach on it because it's difficult. No, that's, that's fear. That's wimpiness as pastors. We need to teach from the Old Testament. Paul said, if you want to understand sin, go to the Old Testament. The law and the prophets teach us about sin. Let's go to verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Don't get scared of that word. We're going to break it down for you this morning. To be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be justified, be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. There's no point in it, in other words. It's nonsense. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we, are, we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith, and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Father, bless the reading of your word this morning. Apply it to our hearts and lives. Let us plumb the depths of your goodness and grace as we plumb the depths of our sin and depravity. For that's what we will speak about this morning. Let every one of us stand convicted but also let every one of us stand confidently knowing we are forgiven because of your righteousness you've given to us. Thank you for the opportunity to speak of these things. I pray that it would be um, <clears throat> reachable, available for everybody in this room this morning that they could understand these deep concepts. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want to backtrack just a little bit as we begin this morning. Romans 1.17, that's the theme of the entire book of Romans. And Romans 1.17 Quoting the Old Testament again, says, The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So all of Romans answers two questions. Who are the just? And what is real faith? And we're going to start really getting into that this morning as, as Paul begins to build a theological framework that's meant to encourage us as we recognize how unable to help ourselves we really are. So we begin with the question, who are the just this morning? Who is justified and worthy of being with God in his presence? The answer is plain. No one in their natural born state has the capability of being justified to be near God. No one. I don't. You don't. Because no one is capable of perfection. All right? You were born imperfect. You cannot achieve perfection. And so you are not justified to be near God. What makes you justified to be near God is someone else's righteousness. 
It's someone else's sacrifice. It's someone else's perfection. And that is Jesus. And what Paul wants to establish for us this morning so that we're all, we're all level here. You, you probably hear this phrase all the time. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. If we're going to be leveled this morning, we all have to understand that we're in the same position. We're in need of somebody else's law keeping. I want to talk about a theological phrase this morning, the doctrine of total depravity. Total depravity, all right? We're entering theology class this morning. The doctrine of total depravity teaches us that we as humans are not capable of achieving a justified and righteous state apart from the power and presence of God. Total depravity is our sinful state that taints our humanity. We inherited this from Adam and Eve. Now, we have to be careful when we talk about what total depravity is to be sure that we understand what total depravity is not. Total depravity doesn't mean you're not capable of doing good things. There's a lot of really good people out there that do really good things, and yet they are still totally depraved. They still have sin in them that they can't overcome. We have a lot of times an, an innate desire to do good, and that's Romans 1. Paul says, even from nature, you learn there's law and order. We study nature, we can see that nature takes care of its own and it takes care of its own kind. The word kindness comes from understanding our kind and caring about our kind and defending and, pro and providing for our kind. All right, it's not what we've made it out to be today. And so within our DNA, there is this understanding that God has created a moral order on this world in every species, included in the human species. Yet the human species is the one species that was made in the, in, in the image of God and spurned the image of God in its self-worship. And that's what happened with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. John Calvin says it this way, All men are conceived in sin and born the children of wrath. We've been talking about wrath. Remember the different types of wrath. Indisposed to all saving good, propense to evil, dead in sin, and the slaves of sin. And without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit, they neither are willing nor able to return to God, to correct their depraved nature, or to dispose themselves to the correction of it. If you study Genesis, and again, sin always starts in Genesis, what's interesting is that Adam and Eve are, are made perfect, and they're made sinless. God puts them in a perfect garden, and he gives them free will. He gives them the freedom, the opportunity to disobey God. He gives them one command, don't eat of the, of the tree. Now, why would God give them free will knowing what was going to happen? Because God wanted a love relationship with them, not an arranged marriage. God wanted a, a, a relationship as such that they could come and desire to be with God and not be forced to be with God. And to do that, he had to allow them the freedom to walk away. And what the Bible teaches us and what theology teaches us is our free will never leads us back to God. Our free will never leads us to good. Our free will only ever leads us to bad things. It only ever leads us to the evil desires of our heart because we are tainted from Adam and Eve. And of course, right after Adam and Eve, the very next story in Scripture is their children getting into a, an argument. Of course, Abel is doing what he's supposed to be doing. Cain's get, Cain gets jealous, his brother, because God has accepted Abel's sacrifice. Abel has brought a sacrifice of a lamb. Only God can produce sheep. Only he can bring them together to reproduce sheep. Cain works his, his fool head off to produce fruit of the soil. God looks at Cain and says, that's your stuff. I want my stuff. Abel has brought me my stuff. And it's a symbol of what Jesus is going to do. Cain, you're only bringing me what you have toiled to do, and I don't accept your sacrifice. What does Cain do? He murders his brother in jealous rage. I mean, instantly, the depravity of man, it's tenfold in the very next generation. Adam and Eve ate fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. We've all done that. Their son murders. And that's what sin does. It moves really fast and it moves really deep. Fast forward to Genesis 6. We have the story of Noah's Ark. So funny how we treat Noah's Ark. We make it into little kids' toys, you know, with the little, uh, little funny animals, and the giraffe is sticking out of the little hole in the side of the ark, and it's so cute, we play with it. And it's such a devastating story. I don't know why we do this as humans, but you know, I guess we just love animals in boats. I mean, God is destroying the world because it's so depraved. In fact, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. He says, we're not having this. We're starting over. 
We're literally going to wipe out the human race except for about eight people. We're going to start again. That's just like five generations in. Five generations in, it is that evil. Now, again, total depravity doesn't imply that man is in, incapable of knowing right from wrong. Romans 1 and 2 establish that. We have a moral conscience. We want, in, in some sense, want to do right, but our hearts will not let us. Total depravity teaches us that man is incapable of always doing right because he has been completely tainted by the original sin of Adam. And to be near God, to be in the presence of God, to have a relationship with God, guess what? I must always do what is right, and I must always have done what is right, and I have not. And so I need help. I need somebody else's record. Total depravity teaches us three important truths about our sin that we need to understand. Number one, it teaches us that our entire person, inside and out, is affected by our sinful condition. And there's not any part of our existence when we are born that isn't permeated and tainted with the sinful condition. Our mind, our soul, our body, and our will. And that's why Jesus said, hey, by the way, you've got to love me with your mind, your heart, your soul, and your will. Every part of you needs to be cleaned and changed and aligned with my will. You look at that little baby that God has given to you. We have babies born all over this church right now. I don't know, maybe the lightning strike will, will stop that. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> it, I'm sure it was COVID. And it was nothing else to do, so we kept warm and, and we made babies. And there's babies everywhere. Now, you look at these little babies, and they, they are born, and they seem so innocent. But moms, you know especially, in about two weeks, you know their sin nature's already there. I mean, they are narcissists. I mean, you think about it. You're never happy. You're, you're not happy if I'm here with you. You're not happy if I leave you with somebody else. I just changed you. You want milk. You had milk. Now you want to burp. You want to throw up. I mean, you're just never, ever, ever, ever happy. We can't sleep. Nobody can sleep in the house. Are you guys ready for this? All right. I'm, just, I'm going deep first, all right? It gets better. You know, it doesn't get better, actually. <laughs> Duh. I won't even go there. This isn't a family seminar. We understand sin. And it doesn't take long, honestly. I mean, I think our, our kids, all three of them, we started to see the sin nature before they were even one years old. The, the way that they would m malign things, the lies that they would tell, and I'm thinking, You're, I mean, who taught you this? I mean, I know where the DNA came from. I know I'm a liar and a stinker, but man, you're good at this. You're really good at this. And parents, we get duped, don't we? The cuteness that they have. It doesn't take long to see the sin nature, because we're born with it. Number two, our very motives behind our righteous efforts are suspect because of sin. So it's bad enough that every part of me, when I am born, is permeated and tainted with the sin of Adam, but now it's so bad, the reality is, even as a believer, even as someone who's been regenerated, and we're going to talk about that this morning, I can't even trust my own motives, because sometimes when I'm doing good, I'm actually not doing good for the right reasons. I'm doing good, so you really think I'm good. Or I'm doing good so you give me something. Or I'm doing good so you'll stay off my back. Or I'm doing good to make you look really bad. That's, the, that's my favorite one. If I do really good, they're going to know how bad that person is. I'll teach you how responsible you should be. I'll just be responsible. I hope everybody looks at you and says you're irresponsible. I mean, we can't even trust the motives of our own heart, even in the good things. Number three. Our physical body will always be subject to sin even after God has given us a new spiritual center. This is going to be Romans 7. So even now, even though God has replaced the inside of me with a brand new inside, and that's sanctification, we're going, to, we're going to get into that doctrine. The reality is in Romans 7, Paul says, even as someone who has surrendered to God and has a new nature, I continue to do the things I know I'm not supposed to do and can't seem to will myself to do the things I don't want to do. And so I keep doing sin and not doing good. This is a war inside of me. How do I fix it? Well, let's break this passage down and let's see what Paul has to say about our sinful condition this morning. And Paul starts again with the Old Testament. And he talks about sin in three ways. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal this from John MacArthur. I don't often steal people's outlines, but this was a really good one. Um, he breaks these next few verses down into three categories. Character, conversation, and conduct. Character, conversation, 
and conduct. All right, he talks about our character in verses 9 through 12. Here's what he says. What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. When the first thing we need to understand about total depravity this morning is that when it comes to total depravity, there are no exceptions. With the exception of Jesus, not a single human has been born sinless with the ability not to sin. Only Jesus had that. There are no other exceptions. And so these scriptures focus on our character and teach us something very important to understand, that sin runs deep. Your sin runs deep. I am amazed at how often my sin runs even deeper than I expected it to. I'll be in the middle of devotions, having a prayer time, and a thought will enter my head and take me down that vortex, and I am critical of this person, and I'm sitting here praying to God, and I'm being critical of this person that I just want to chastise, and God's like, hey, while you're talking to me, can we just cut the sin out for a little bit? I literally got up talking to you and I'm sinning at the same time. I can't believe how deep my sin runs. Ephesians 4.18, Paul said it this way in, in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Now people can do good but that doesn't make them good. I, I love this thing. We hear this all the time. Even a clock is, is, a broken clock is right twice a day. That clock's been, I finally fixed it, but it was broken for weeks and weeks and weeks. But it was twice a day where it was right on time, right? Sometimes really bad people can do really good things. That doesn't make them good. If we're seeking God, we need to understand something. If we're seeking to do good, and we're seeking God, is because he is first seeking us. First John chapter 4, verse 19, we talked about this a few months ago. We love, why? Because he what? First loved us. No one seeks after God of their own will. God has to call them. God has to remove the blinders. He has to give us an innate desire to want him, to desire him. Our best attempts at perfect obedience will always fall short of perfection without Jesus. So now we move from character to conduct and conversation. Here's what the next few verses say. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongue to deceive. The venom of poisonous snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And this tells us something very important about total depravity. Total depravity is the cause of all human evil. Why did God bring human evil into this world? He didn't. He allowed you to be a free will sinner. And your sin has brought human evil. If you stop sinning, if I stop sinning, if the world stops sinning, this world gets cleaned up really quick. It becomes a paradise on earth. But we are incapable. God created the world perfect. It was Adam and Eve's sin that brought the first Suffering. It brought the first suffering of animals. It brought the first suffering of humanity. These scriptures focus on our conversation and our conduct, and they teach us that sin is destructive. Sin is destructive. I never know, we never know, the far-reaching devastation of our, our small sins. One lie that turns into one gossip session that turns into the defaming of someone's character that leads that someone's defaming into their depression and eventual suicide. I mean, if you follow sin back and you follow devastation back, most devastation, if you follow it back, started somewhere with some minuscule sin in somebody's heart. Even the very wars that we watch rage. You think about World War II. That started in the evil of a few men's hearts who had covetousness and idolatry and anger 
And we lost millions and millions and millions of people. And it all started with the inner heart sin of just a few evil men. We never stop to think of the devastation of our sin. Men especially. Let me talk to you this morning. When we struggle with lust, we never stop to think about the devastation it could cause in our families. That little pet sin we keep that think doesn't, we don't think affects anybody else, that if it gets out of control, can destroy our families and destroy generations of our kids. Employees, we never stop to think about that little, just that little sin we did of, of lying here on a document or cheating there or taking something from the office that can hurt our character in the, in the workplace. And people begin to say, well, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be a part of that. And it sends them away from heaven and towards hell. And we thought that was such a small thing. We always look at the devastation and the fallout of our sin and we think, how did it get here? But we never stop in those little moments with those little heart sins to stop and say, where could this go? What devastation could this cause? And I think if we did that, we probably would sin half the time we're sinning. Because if you played it out of what it would cause, you would not want that. Look at the next few verses. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Now get the picture here. Okay? God is trying to help us understand that he did not give us the law for our glory. And for our pride, he gave us the law so that we can plainly see that we are not law keepers. He gave us the law to be an illuminator to how sinful we really are. This isn't righteousness keeping. This is just being honest. So he says this in verse 20, For by works of the law, no human being will ever be justified in his sight. No one will ever be declared righteous since through the law comes knowledge of sin. God gave you the law so you could see you were a sinner. It's like putting a mirror in front of your face and that's what James says exactly the scriptures are. And remember, James is writing the New Testament. He's talking about the Old Testament. He's literally saying God gave you the law as a mirror so you could look in the mirror and go, man, I'm a wreck. There's some things here that need to be addressed. I can't believe I would even go out like this. Well, it's who you really are. You aren't the you that comes to Sunday church. You are the you that wakes up at 6.45 in the morning before coffee. That's the real you. From how your breath smells, to how your hair looks, to your crankiness, that's the real you. You have to work out of that through the Holy Spirit and, and caffeine. Right? And so the law gives you the privilege of seeing what I really am in the, in the deep darkness of my heart. I'm not a law keeper at all. I'm a hot mess. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. God says here through Paul, listen, the law is your mirror, but you need to look better than that. You can't look like you're supposed to look, so I'm going to give you the image of somebody else who you can look just like, and that's Jesus. You take on his image, you'll be where you're supposed to be. Because his image is perfect. Let's learn something else about total depravity this morning. Total depravity cannot be remedied through law-keeping, but it is revealed through law-keeping. This is really important for us to understand when it comes to the study of dispensationalism. The law was not a dispensation of salvation. It was a direction towards the Savior. The law was not a dispensation of salvation. It was a direction towards the Savior. God didn't save people in the Old Testament through the law. He pointed them to the Savior who would save them. That was the whole point of Passover. The Jews couldn't save themselves. They had to trust the blood of the Lamb on their house, on their dwelling. You can't save yourself. You need to trust the blood of the Lamb on your house, on your dwelling, on your body, on your life. And the law pointed forward to someone who would fulfill that requirement. 
Nobody was ever saved by the law. We were only ever condemned by the law and saw the knowledge of the reality of our sin by the law. It was always about the faith in another one, another sacrifice, another lawkeeper, Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is saying here. The law was a covenant for God's preservation of Israel to bring the Messiah. But Jesus instituted a new covenant for all mankind. Jesus fulfilled all the previous covenants. The Bible says that every promise finds its yes in Jesus. Every covenant was fulfilled. Jesus is the covenant keeper. He's the new covenant. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper all the time. Let me quote Daniel Doriani from his Reformed Expository Commentary on Romans. He says this, I love this. Jesus did all that God promised in his covenants. He bound us to himself, to one another, in a community governed by love, forbearance, mercy, and justice. All the, the play out of the covenants happened in Jesus. All the things that were supposed to happen, happened in Jesus. And so this new covenant is received through faith in Jesus. It's not received through law keeping. Now let's look what it says next. I'm going to get into some big words here. This is literally the theology class, the first class of soteriology right here. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I love it. The old preachers used to say, we all have falling shorts. That's not a good thing. But it's good to recognize. None of us are where we're supposed to be. Okay, here's what it says in verse 24. We are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. All right, big words. Justification, redemption, propitiation. We're going to break all those down in just a minute. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins. Do you see the word there? Passed over? It's literally Passover. Jesus is literally bringing forward, sorry, Paul is literally bringing forward here the language of Passover. All of these things that we're going to talk about this morning were pictured in Passover, in Exodus. We're getting ready to celebrate this at Easter. This is exciting. What a perfect time to talk about this. Being made righteous, having a blood payment applied to my sin account. Now look what it says in verse 26. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now Martin Martin Luther and and many other old-time theologians believe that these verses were the chief point and the very central part of this letter and pretty much of the whole New Testament. This right here, right now. Because it's bringing in all of the imagery of the Old Testament and helping us understand how it teaches us the gospel. Now let's learn something else about total depravity as we move on. Total depravity levels the ground of our standing before Christ. Rendering us all in equal need of His saving work of justification. We are all in equal need. I don't care how good your life has been. I don't care how bad your life has been. I don't care how long you've been a believer. I don't care how short you've been a believer. At the end of the day, we stand at the cross and every one of us has the same status. We're either forgiven because of God's grace or we're not. But we're all sinners. Every one of us. Remember, the doctrine of justification is that God sees me just as if I'd never sinned And I'll take it a step further, and just as if I'd always obeyed. This is another doctrine. The doctrine of justification teaches me that I can know confidently that God sees me as sinless because of Jesus, and not only sees me as sinless as my sin has been erased, but as someone who is as if he'd always obeyed the law, because Jesus always obeyed the law. Justified and justification, these words come from the same root word for righteousness, which is the word dikaiosune. This is a really important understanding because justice and righteousness are the same thing. Do you look righteous to God? Well, if you have Jesus, you do because Jesus was righteous. Therefore, you are justified to be in his presence because you're righteous. 
Now, Paul says in these verses that God passed over the former sins or sins before Jesus because only Jesus' blood was good enough to satisfy eternal wrath. Now, here's what he's saying. What about all of the sacrifices all of the Israelites had to do for all those years for their sins? Those sacrifices allowed them to live on this earth without the immediate wrath of God. But they could not satisfy the eternal wrath. And so God looks over all of these sins and he looks forward to the one, Jesus, who's going to pay for all those sins. It's almost like a layaway plan. Just keep putting it forward. We're just going to keep paying on this. Just keep paying on this. But you don't pay, it's not paid until it's paid in full. And you could never pay your sin debt in full. You'd be laying that stuff over forever. Jesus comes, bam, done. I got it. That's what Hebrews 11 is about, by the way. And, and the author of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, recounts all of these Old Testament figures like Abraham who knew they were sinners, who knew they needed to pay for their sin debt, but knew in sacrifice they would never be able to pay for it, and they trusted, the Bible says, a Redeemer yet to come, Jesus, the same Redeemer we put our trust in. Now, let me reiterate, our best attempts at perfect obedience will always fall short of perfection without Jesus. That's Romans 3.23. Enter the doctrine of propitiation. This is a fun word. It's even fun to say because when you say it, you kind of spit a little bit. Propitiation. Justification, all right, being in a right standing with God is achieved through propitiation. This is the Greek word hilasterion. This word is really specific to worship and finding favor, not just with God big G, but also God's little g. You might be surprised by this. In the Greco-Roman culture, people would bring sacrifices to pagan temples and, and that the gods of those temples would favor them as worshipers, rendering the gods favorable or propiti- propitious, it's a weird word, towards the worshiper. So they would bring whatever it was to the temple, whether it was gold or silver um, or a sacrifice, or sometimes it was even human sacrifices, and they would bring this to the pagan temples and they would offer their gift in hopes that that particular god, whatever god was of that temple, would find favor on that person. If they were favorable towards you, they were propitious towards you. Now think about this. The propitiation was the payment to bring favor. This goes beyond appeasing the wrath of God. It swings the pendulum from being under the wrath of God all the way over to being in favor with God. And that's what justification is. So Jesus was the propitiator being propitiated. And because Jesus offered his blood on my account, it's not that I'm not under God's wrath anymore, and that's true. I'm no longer under God's wrath. But he has swung me all the way over here to being able to stand in the favor of God. So that's why justification isn't just as if I'd never sinned. It's also just as if I'd always obeyed. I'm in favor with God. God favors me because he favors Jesus. In the Old Testament law, this word propitiation had to do with the mercy seat that sat on top of the ark in the covenant. Have you ever seen Indiana Jones, right? The Raiders of the Lost Ark. You've seen the ark. It's got those two cherubim there and their their wings come across. And it's pretty true and accurate. That's where the Holy Spirit of God would reside in the tabernacle and in the temple on the mercy seat. So this word propitiation was used for this idea of the mercy seat. It was used for this idea of payment being made for Israel. And so the the high priest would take the blood of the atonement and he would take it in and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Offering a payment, offering propitiation for the nations of Israel. And it didn't just satisfy the wrath of God against Israel. It reminded Israel that they were favored by God as his chosen people. You and I are favored by God. The blood of Jesus has made us favorable to God. He has chosen us. He has redeemed us. This means that God is both the propitiated and the propitiation through Jesus. So here's the doctrine this morning. The propitiation of Jesus for us didn't just appease God's wrath towards sin. It brought us into a favorable position with God. God favors you. If you have accepted Jesus' blood payment, he looks at you with endearment. He wants you to be near him. His eyes light up towards you because they light up towards his son. 
What father wouldn't be proud of his son? You are God's sons and daughters. The favor of Jesus before God rests on you. This is why justification isn't merely just I've never, as I've never sinned, but also just as if I'd always obeyed. Now, what is justification? Being right with God through propitiation, the payment for my sin, result. It results in redemption. Redemption is best described as the economy of bond servitude. The Greek word, which is uh, apolotrosis, is sometimes translated as ransom. When someone was working off a debt as a servant, they were redeemed as a free citizen once that debt was paid off. And so in this economy, if you owed somebody money and you didn't have the money, you could work for them for a set amount of years. Okay, well, I think this is worth five years of hard labor in my fields. Okay, I'm going to give you five years of hard labor in your fields. And the day that that labor was done, they were emancipated. They were redeemed. They were basically purchased back. Their freedom was purchased back. So that's what redemption is. Our redemption to freedom from the law and unto Christ was accomplished through Jesus Christ's propitiation. Now we have to understand something. Jesus said it this way, He whom the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. But did you know you weren't just set free to become your own person? You were purchased. You were redeemed. And so what Jesus did is he said, Okay, you've got an eternity in those fields to pay off your sin debt. I'm going, to read, I'm, going to, I'm going to ransom you. And I'm going to put you in my family. Forget working in my fields. You're going to be a family member. I'm going to call you my child. And I'm going to put sandals on your feet. And I'm going to put a ring on your finger. And I'm going to put a special coat on your back. Who does that sound like? Prodigal son. That's the picture. And, and the prodigal son realizes what he's done. And he realizes he, he needs to be ransomed back to his father. And he says, I'm not even worthy to be his son. I'm just going to go back and work in his field. And his father says, no, 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 you're my son. You're my son. I'm bringing you home. That's redemption. Jesus saying to you, you cannot pay your sin debt. I'm not going to force you to pay your sin debt. I paid your sin debt. Come live freely in my house. But by the way, you belong to me now. You bear my name. And, and you're going to live your life in debt of me. And it's going to be a wonderful life. Not always easy. Not always your favorite things are going to happen. But you're going to have a purpose. And I'm going to make sense of your reality. And I'm going to give you an eternity in the presence of our Father. How do I receive this propitiation as my propitiation? The answer is this, through humble faith. Through humble faith. Look at the end of this chapter. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No. By the law of faith. He's doing another diatribe here. He's arguing both sides. Can I be proud of Jesus' righteousness? No, you don't get to be proud of Jesus' righteousness. Jesus is proud of his righteousness. You should be humbled. Because you're not a law keeper. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. I mean, hear that clearly. This is hermeneutics 101, how we read the scriptures. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. All of your law keeping could not justify you. You needed somebody else's record. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. So here's what he's saying. People that are like Gentiles who came to God from the dregs of sin came to God through faith. All right? And God brought them and they, and they placed their faith in Jesus. But they were justified by faith. So when you come to God and you have this sinful record and you say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I've messed up. God says, yeah, I know you've messed up. But you have my record of righteousness. Place your faith in my work. I have a justification by faith. But if I've come to God and said, God, honestly, I've been a pretty good person. 
I mean, that was my story. I got saved at four years old. How much sin was there to commit before I was four, besides being a narcissist? What was there really to do? I mean, I didn't run a drug cartel, all right? And so I come to, a guy like me comes to God and says, God, I've, left a, I've led a pretty good life. Do I still need you? And God says, yeah, you've kept a good life, but you still have to come through faith. Yeah, that person over there, terrible life, made a lot of bad decisions, committed a lot of sin. They had to come by faith that God would actually accept them. But you know what you need to do? Come out of your works and you need to come through faith. Because your law keeping is never going to bring you into righteousness, into justification. We both had to come the same way, faith. So here's our final thought on total depravity this morning. Total depravity helps me understand that faith in Christ is the source of my obedience, not my own righteousness. True obedience doesn't begin with works. Your true obedience begins, it begins with faith. In fact, I never fully obeyed God in perfection and sincerity until after salvation, even if I did a lot of good things before salvation. True obedience began with Jesus, and Jesus began in my life at salvation. So that's when the obedience began. Remember, I said this a couple weeks ago. I think I said it last week, actually. And I love how often our, our family theology Sundays match up with what we're learning in adult Sundays. But Romans, is, I mean, it permeates everything. I said this last week. Love-keeping results in law-keeping, but law-keeping isn't always love-keeping. God loved me first. I love him back. In loving him back, I practice obedience to the law. Now, let's be clear. When we talk about the law, what we're we talking about, we're we talking about the Mosaic law? No, we're not talking about the Decalogue. All of God's moral order and moral code comes out of the Ten Commandments. And even before the Ten Commandments, everything he taught in Scripture, you can line up with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are everything. All of the New Testament law-keeping, all of the New Testament morality can be boiled down to the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. We're going to study the Ten Commandments in our family uh, theology Sundays over the next few months. So hopefully you and your kids are going to remember the Ten Commandments and learn them together. And so Paul wants us to understand that I don't keep the Ten Commandments so that God will be pleased with me because I can't keep them. I keep the Ten Commandments because God is pleased with Jesus and I have Jesus, so God is pleased with me. And so in response to loving God, I love him by being obedient to him, but I don't get his love just because I'm obedient. I already have his love and I respond with obedience. Now, how should we respond to the doctrine of total depravity. Nobody likes talking about sin. Nobody likes talking about our sin. We don't like admitting our sin. We don't like even confessing our sin. It's like our least favorite topic. Let's talk about good things. Let's talk about God's grace and God's mercy and God's love. Awesome, God's peace, God's joy and God's hope. But let's talk about our sin. No, I don't really want to talk about my sin. So how do I respond to this? Why do I even want to know the doctrine of total depravity? It's not even encouraging, is it? (laughs) You know how I respond? Simply, humility. Humility. Total depravity demands humility. Now, humility is not thinking less of ourselves. Humility is thinking of ourselves less. So what we're not asking you to do, what the Scriptures is not asking you to do, what God is not asking you to do, is say, woe is me, I'm the worst sinner. Just, it's, you don't have to be Eeyore. All right? Now, you don't have to be Tigger either. He's annoying, but... You don't have to be Eeyore. The point is to stop even thinking about my sinful condition and start thinking about Jesus. That's where my focus has to be. The doctrine of total depravity should lift our view away from ourselves and up to the love of Christ given through grace and mercy. Now, why do I confess my sin? Not because I want to ruminate on my sin. I'm confessing my sin because every time I look at Jesus, I realize how sinful I am. And I want to be more like Jesus. So I look at my life and say, oh, that's Jesus. This is me. I want to be more like that. God, can you help me be more like that? I'm sorry I'm like this. I want to be like that. You know what God's response is, according to the scriptures? What are you talking about? I separated your sin as far as east is from the west, Psalm 103. I see you like Jesus, but thanks for confessing. Let's carry on being like Jesus. To stop ruminating on the negative, we must focus on the positive. The gospel is replacement therapy. Do you realize that? All you psychology buffs, all of you love counseling like me, 
The gospel is replacement therapy. That's what sanctification is. The rest of this letter, the rest of Romans is about replacing the bad thoughts with the good thoughts and understanding what God wants to do. In fact, let's practice some replacement therapy right now, okay? This is something I do in counseling. For the next, I'm going to give you, let's see if I can set a timer here. Oh, I turned Siri off because she was annoying me. Okay, I'll just time it the old-fashioned way. For the next 20 seconds, I don't want you to think about the number seven, okay? Just don't think about it. It's really just an upside-down L anyway. It's kind of straight, kind of slanty, just a you know, perfect number, but don't think about it. Just put it out of your mind. Don't think about it. How many of you thought about the number seven? Yeah. All right, let's do something else, okay. Here we go. For the next 20 seconds, I want you to think about number eight. Looks like a snowman, doesn't it? Do you know what the eight said to the zero? No, do you know what the zero said to the eight? Where'd you get the belt? That's what the zero said to the eight. I got the joke right, Lauren. How many of you were thinking about number seven? It's because you're stubborn. But the rest of you, the rest of you, I'm just messing. The rest of you were thinking about number eight, right? You were changing where your focus was. That's replacement therapy. We're saying, I, if I'm, if I'm going to get out of that, I've got to focus on this. By the way, for those, of who, those who struggle with the temptation of lust, this is what we teach. Get away from the computer, especially at night. Get your mind busy. Engage in other things. But if you're ruminating on things, you have to, you can't just, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm not. No, you have to think about something different. Now, here's what I'm trying to get to. If all you do is constantly focus on how sinful you are and how much your struggle with sin is and how you can't nail it and how you want to nail it, you know what you're going to do? You're going to battle sin. But if you will start permeating your mind with the goodness of the gospel of grace, who Jesus is and what he's done and how much he loves you and how perfect he was and how he's given you his righteousness, your mind will go somewhere different entirely. It's like when they teach these alpine skiers to ski and they say, if you, if you keep saying, I'm not going to hit a tree, I'm not going to hit a tree, I'm not going to hit a tree, you're going to hit a tree. But if you focus on where the path is, you're going to get there. Let me give you one more dumb illustration. Went to England a few years ago with a good friend. We were walking through London. It was very crowded. And I was walking into everybody. And we were, pack, we were backpacking, so I had an 80-pound pack on. And it was, I just looked like a clumsy fool. And the person I was with was in the Navy, and he said, when I was in the Navy ships, they taught us to look where you're going, not at the people you're trying to get around. Because your body naturally goes where you look. So I just started looking where I was supposed to go, and all of a sudden, I'm missing everybody. I'm like, this is brilliant. I should have joined the Navy. I could learn how to walk, you know? <laughs> it's a great illustration. Stop trying to figure out where to walk and just follow Jesus. He knows where he's going. Just follow him. Just walk with him. Easter is replacement therapy. We start with Good Friday. We remember our sin, and we are called to remember our sin. We are called to confess our sin. And we celebrate the fact that Jesus took our sin off the cross. And in that moment, he was so buried underneath our sin that his very father had to look away. That's how deep our sin runs. And God's hung there naked, bearing all of our sin and all of our shame. And he was naked on purpose. Go all the way back to Genesis 3. What was the first thing they realized? They were naked. The shame of their life. Jesus hung in our shame. And he hung in our sin. And God has to turn his back. It is so putrid and disgusting. It is so depraved. And he dies our death. His blood is shed in our place. And he goes to that tomb. And the sin stays there. And we focus not on the cross. We don't focus on Jesus on the cross. We focus on the tomb. That's the focal point. It's the victory. It's what Jesus has done for us coming out of the grave. And so we take that Sunday and we realign our life again and we say, I'm going to focus on what Jesus has done for me, not of how I've failed him. I'm going to focus on the victory he's offered me. I'm going to focus on him being the Passover lamb that has come out of that sin, that, that grave, leaving my sin behind. And I'm going to follow his path. What an illustration. What a therapy for a sinful condition, right? Father, that's the joy of the gospel. He became sin who knew no sin so that we could become his righteousness. 
And so God, we want to replace these thoughts of our sinful condition. We want to recognize it. We want to understand it. We want to know it. We want to believe it. And God, I pray if there's someone here this morning who hasn't surrendered their life to you, that they'd recognize they are going to have to continue working in the field of destruction for the entirety of their existence. But you have offered them freedom. You've offered them redemption. But God, once we are redeemed, once we've accepted that, our focal point isn't ourselves. It's, it's not to think less of ourselves. It's to think of ourselves less and to think of you more. So, Father God, I pray that you would take our, our focus, the gaze of our, our eyes, and I pray that you bring them up to your goodness and glory, to your grace and mercy given to us at the cross, granted victoriousness through the, the empty tomb. Help us to dwell there. Let the gospel be our focus and our joy and our energy. Let it be the mantra of our life each and every day. Yes, it starts with our sinful condition, but that's not where we dwell. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us of the gospel. And God the Father, thank you for being the propitiator and the propitiated. Thank you for giving us your son. Thank you for redeeming us through his blood and bringing him out victorious. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together.